Group's special report. Thanks for joining us for this special report. I'm Jennifer Abreu. Let's get right to the Public Safety Center in Springfield, where Clay Goddard is speaking right now about COVID-19 in the area as college students return to class. Let's take a listen. COVID-19 reported. And on Wednesday, we received 82 new cases. I know we all want to know where these cases are coming from, and I certainly do. I won't be able to give you all the answers today, um, but we are continuing to investigate these cases. And I can tell you the circumstances of some of them. Uh, we can attribute a number of these cases to the jail and to long-term care facilities. We know of at least 42 cases in these institutional settings. And as we continue to investigate, there will likely be more. That's not entirely surprising. I've said before that COVID-19 thrives on density and intensity and a congregate living situation is a perfect environment for disease transmission. But we're also seeing big groups of people getting together and contributing to disease spread. Listen, we all know that masking is working. The science supports this. Uh, communities and states that have implemented masking have shown downward trends. Uh, there was a study uh, released earlier this week that shows communities in Kansas with local mandates and it, it uh, continues to bear out that this uh, is a uh, uh, mitigating uh, factor for disease transmission. But masking is not a silver bullet. We need people to remember to practice all of the tools that we have for prevention. Wash your hands regularly um, and stay home if you're sick. And I know I continue to be a buzzkill but we need to avoid high-risk activities such as gathering in large groups, ignoring masking and physical distancing when we're gathered in those large groups. And I think many of us are perhaps letting our guard down when we're around people that we know well who don't reside under the same roof that we do. We can't have a false sense of security in those settings, and we have to continue to be vigilant because this is one of our biggest vulnerabilities in, there, in our community, and I believe that uh, we're seeing some disease transmission occurring in those environments. We know there are aspects of our lives that we're returning to, and we need to do that as safely as possible. Colleges and universities uh, are, um, hang on. Colleges and universities are a great and timely example of this. I have been so impressed and encouraged about how universities and colleges have adjusted and evolved as our understanding of COVID-19 has advanced. Our community's educators are doing all that they can to keep our students safe and, and healthy. This is so important. Uh, higher education is a fundamental fabric of Springfield and it's an important piece of our community. So it's important we get these students back and that we continue to, to educate them in a safe manner. And I know they've begun to return. I've seen several on the MSU campus. And I want to start by saying welcome back. Uh, we're happy to have you back. But just as your university has planned and prepared for COVID-19, we need you to do the same. We need you to get creative and find ways to spend time with your friends that don't mean big groups of people that are close together. We need you to have a plan for how you're going to navigate this new normal uh, this coming fall. We know that you're up for the challenge. Our young adults are some of the most motivated, creative, and capable generations that I've ever encountered. You will find ways to live, to work, and to socialize that keep you and the people you care about from the further spread of illness. I have every confidence that you will find solutions that the rest of us will copy. We as a community control our own destiny going forward. And if we keep going to bars and, and other spaces and crowd together, this disease will keep spreading. It's going to continue to seek out our vulnerabilities. If we don't go to large events, and, or, or if we keep going rather to large events and don't properly wear masks and maintain physical distancing, the disease is going to continue to spread. And if we keep trying to return to normal and forget that we're still in a pandemic, this disease will continue to wreak havoc on our community. 
I'll end my formal remarks there. I'm sure there will be questions uh, at the uh, end of uh, the program. But next, we're going to hear from our uh, mayor, uh, Mayor Kim McClure. Good morning, and especially good morning to our friends in the media. We continue to be very grateful for the excellent work that you're doing to keep our community informed. It's much needed, and we are very appreciative. And thank you, too, Clay, for the work that you and your team are doing to help us identify, trace, and manage through this public health crisis. I know how exhausting it is. I know it can be overwhelming at times. And I want you to know on behalf of my colleagues on City Council how much we deeply appreciate it. And thank you, too, for reminding us of the difficulties that we are facing and providing an unvarnished look at what could be coming in the days ahead. This is a health crisis. It's not a time for civil disobedience. I am so proud of the many residents that I see every day doing everything they can to help reduce the spread of this awful virus. I challenge every member of the community to take personal responsibility Wear a mask, wash your hands, stay at home if you feel the slightest bit sick. There is so much at stake here. We have shown that the community can indeed control its own destiny. This is a time that we must continue to rely upon the expertise of our local doctors and our health department professionals. They have dedicated their lives and their professions to studying the science, the medicine they've chosen to practice here, and they take care of all of us. We must heed their advice and their expertise. This is somewhat of a housekeeping matter in order to ensure that the city has the needed flexibility in the coming weeks, but I am issuing the first renewal of the sixth proclamation of civil emergency effective August 15 through 11.59 p.m. on September 13, based upon a recommendation from the Springfield Green County Health Department to the mayor and the city council. There continues to reasonably appear to exist a state of civil emergency due to the passage of an ordinance by city council setting out regulations to protect public health and safety from the spread of COVID-19. I do not believe that it is necessary to exercise the additional powers granted to the mayor under city code at the present time. So in short, nothing changes for the next 30 days. Cora. Thank you, Mayor. Before we go to questions, and I just want to remind the media who are not in the room, you can text your questions to me and we will pose them to the subject matter experts in the room. Um, we are blessed here at the city and the health department to hear from a lot of people in the community who are sharing their stories. They're sharing the stories of what they're doing to help prevent the spread um, in both their businesses and in their homes. We're also hearing from folks who unfortunately have been directly affected by the virus. Um, we have a gentleman um, who wants to share his story with the community today. Um, he's very brave in doing so, but we have a short video that we will play first in this news conference, and then it will be available on our social media sites and on our website. But please take a moment to hear the story of one local man. His name is Tom Gammon, and he is um, talking about his wife, Joyce. Thank you. My name is Tom Gammon, and uh, I lost my wife, Joyce, of 33 years to COVID-19, June 16th of this year. You know, Joyce, uh, Joyce loved people, rarely met a stranger. When we would be shopping in the grocery store, she would almost always strike up a conversation with some person in the store or the cashier as we were leaving. I would be impatient, ready to go out to the car, and she would still be there visiting. You know, she just loved people. Uh, she uh, uh, loved working at the kitchen. Uh, she had a huge heart for uh, uh, people. In fact, her favorite uh, Bible verse was, whatsoever you do unto the least of these, you also do unto me. Uh, and she, she tried to live by that. She loved her family. We have you know, five kids and a plethora of grandkids. We had four great-grandkids, and she really loved those grandkids. 
And in fact, the, you know, she retired in the end of December, and that was part of her plan to spend more time with grandkids. You know, Joyce was one of those people who would get a Starbucks gift card and go to Starbucks and pay for her coffee and say, just use it on the people behind me. Uh, she was a generous person. She loved flowers. She loved gardening. Her grandmother and her mother both were gardeners, and, and uh, Joyce inherited that. Joyce and I landscaped every house we lived in, and, and she planted flower bed after flower bed and, and loved taking care of her flowers. She loved baseball. Uh, she's a huge baseball fan. Her and my mom used to go uh, get tickets behind home plate at, for the Springfield Cardinals and correct the umpires all night. <laughs> we wore masks everywhere. Uh, you know, at home we didn't wear them. Uh, but anytime we went to the store or to Lowe's or, you know, shop, uh, grocery shopping or whatever we did, uh, we wore masks. We didn't. Uh, we avoided a lot of places just because of crowds, uh, too many people. Um, you know, when they first let the restaurants come back open, we went to a local restaurant one night and it was just too crowded and they weren't being safe, so we left. I think if we had masked up earlier, I'd probably still have my wife today. And we'd be, you know, look, looking towards our retirement plan. You know, it's a, uh, wearing masks, social distancing, and, and it's so easy to clean your hands. Soap and water or, or hand sanitizer, you can, it's all available. You know, it's not hard to find now. Just, you just do those simple things. You know, I've gone to a grave talk to her and uh, just tell her that's her best her and I love her and that uh, she's the love of my life and the family dearly misses her and we all wish she was here We appreciate Tom and the Gammon family for um, sharing, sharing their story and for being outspoken about what people can do to help prevent the spread of COVID-19. Um, Joyce um, Gammon was a resident of Christian County, but we now have 16 deaths in Greene County, which while the number itself is low, there are plenty of people who are sick, and so we don't, we don't take that lightly. So we will go to questions um, from media in the room first, and then from those who've um, been texted in. So we will start with Jason Work with the Ozarks Independent. Come on up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, first question for you. Uh, there's been a lot of conversation in the community about athletics, football, soccer, parents wondering whether they should enroll their kids in, in youth leagues this fall. How, in, from your opinion at the health department, what is the inherent risk in team athletics like football or soccer? It depends on the sport, uh, but contact sports such as football and, and soccer uh, are going to be, uh, you know, higher risk because they are uh, contact sports. Uh, so, uh, you know, I know that uh, the the state uh, athletics association is looking at that, and and uh, uh, certainly SPS and all of the region schools, uh, you know, are working through protocols. Uh, but that is going to increase risk when you've got uh, kids, you know, close together like that in those contact sport environments. Now, the recent statistics have shown increases in cases in the younger demographics. Are you seeing that trend continue? Yes. Um, Catherine, did we get that information? It uh, looks like our largest age group of cases during the past three weeks is in the 20 to 29-year-old cohort. And so, uh, um, you know, I think that there's some concern that that demographic in particular is rejecting some of these prevention messages. Uh, so that's a, a significant concern for us in the community. There's always a boomerang effect. So uh, you end up with a cohort in, in that age group then carrying it to their parents or to their grandparents or to coworkers who have comorbidities. So it's important that we take this on, uh, you know, regardless of our age group. Uh, you may not be able to answer this one, mm -hmm. but with the increase in cases we've seen, the record cases we have, 
have you started having discussions about maybe recommending the, to the city government, the county government, that we take a step back in our coming forward? So we're going to take a hard look at the epidemiology, and uh, uh, I think we're going to let data drive our decisions. Uh, you know, we have a couple of days with high case counts. Um, is that a trend? You know, not yet. So I want to continue to watch cases. I want to see where these cases are contracting the illness uh, before we make any kind of policy recommendations uh, or even open that door. I have a question for Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Mayor, you briefly mentioned civil disobedience, and there are a number of citizens who are expressing their social dis uh, disobedience. Are, are you going to call on the police department to maybe bring more strict enforcement of the masking mandate? I think the police department has handled this very well. They've got a protocol in place where if a business reports uh, instances, for example, without masks, they do contact the business, they do try to work. The best approach is to try to work through that informally and encourage compliance. Uh, you don't want to have a heavy hand, but on the other hand, civil disobedience, it's fine to express your disagreement if you wish, but all I'm saying is follow the law. This morning, have you been in contact with university leaders, been having conversations, and how are those going? Uh, I, I want to give my uh, most sincere compliments to our higher educational leaders. They've been involved in conversations with us since March, and uh, we have weekly calls uh, with uh, university presidents, with their staff. Uh, they've built robust protocols. Uh, they're taking this very seriously. And I can tell you, uh, as a health director, um, from talking to you know other health directors in the state, we've had probably the highest level of engagement of, of any community. Uh, they, they've been uh, at, at the table and, and very serious about this from the beginning. So uh, they've got uh, my uh, most sincere admiration for the approach that they've taken. I want to add that we're also working with college students um, in focus groups and um, helping us to come up with ways to get out the message to, to the younger, younger citizens um, about the importance of masking and socially distancing. So that's been very helpful as well. Joe? Uh, several for Mr. Goddard. Sorry. Okay. I was going to pick on Cora, but we're going to pick on you instead. Um, Obviously, one of the questions that I think the public has is uh, if we're worried about the large numbers and we've had some record cases, does that mean that the mask mandate is not working? Do you have some stats to show that it is? So uh, I don't believe that we can uh, say that it's not working. I'd hate to see what the numbers would be without uh, the mask mandate. I think that uh, w what we've got is a spike in institutional cases, which are, are driving numbers up. Um, and I also believe uh, what I stated uh, in, in my formal comments, that we have people that are maybe using the mask as a crutch and then they're, you know, uh, letting their guard down when they're meeting with people that they trust. And uh, uh, that, I can see how that naturally would occur. Uh, but when we're meeting people in a social setting or we're, we're going to a large crowded environment, uh, that's going to be a per perfect recipe. Uh, for disease transmission. So don't forget those other complementary pieces of the equation. Physical distancing, uh, you know, crowd density, and masking are all complementary, and we need to use them together, particularly now. We need to go, uh, go out and navigate the community as if everybody is sick. And so the better we can do at using those prevention pieces, the more effective we're going to be at, draw, at really driving that R not value down below one. That's where we want to be. The Missouri Hospital Association uh, releases some modeling data that suggests we're somewhere in the 1.25 range in southwest Missouri. So what that means, Joe, is that if I'm sick, I'm going to give it to 1.25 individuals, and that means that cases continue to grow. So. 
we all know the messages. We, we know what works. Let's employ them as a community, and we can influence the virus. You mentioned a couple of stats to the city council last week, though, um, as far as the, the mask mandate, I think uh, social uh, sources was one of them. Is there, is there any other stats that you've got that shows that masking is working? Uh, you know, when you have case growth, uh, it's a complicated uh, approach, but uh, I, I can tell you that our, our disease rate is lower than a lot of the surrounding counties when you calculate it per 100,000 population. And so uh, uh, I've got to think that, uh, uh, once again, I'd hate to know where we would be if we didn't have this in place. Uh, apparently there's some people on Facebook wondering if the concern is about gr large groups, why wasn't the fair canceled? Uh, you know, the, the fair met all of the uh, restrictions that we had in uh, the ordinance related to density. Uh, if you start to pick off individual events, then you have to take a look holistically at other environments uh, that, that gather large groups of people. So, uh, you know, that's something that we're going to continue to look at through our epidemiology, see if there's cases linked back to the fair, and we can use that to inform future uh, policy decisions, but uh, I don't have necessarily a big, uh, uh, you know, broad evidence that it's the uh, uh, cause of this spike in illness. What about the jail situation? How much of a role did that play in your record numbers situation? Forty-two of those cases uh, over the last two days came from, uh, uh, you know, those congregate environments uh, uh, through institutional environments. So it's a big, a big chunk of the cases. Yes. Think more could have been done in that situation to keep that from spreading. I know y'all sent a lot of masks over there, and I don't know if that was a little late or what your feelings are about the way that was. If, if you followed uh, institutional settings uh, uh, across the country uh, and jails included in that, uh, that's a significant challenge, and and uh, uh, so uh, uh, that's going to be a, a hard thing to keep those cases out of the jail. Uh, we're working with the sheriff's office to uh, give them guidance on how they can control uh, further spread. But uh, when you have people, you know, housed together in, in those settings, that's a that's a really tough thing to to stop spread. You've obviously talked about the fact that everyone's working real hard to let the students coming in know how important it is to do what they need to do. Uh, President Smart said that he really feels good about it, but at the same time, he said the last four months have been the toughest of his professional life and. The next four weeks, as in these weeks coming up, uh, he expects to be 10 times worse. How worried are y'all about the student population coming in for college and what it might mean to more cases? Well, we, you know, you always worry about it, and you're going to have some cases in college students. So that's just the nature of this virus. Uh, and, you know, I, I think there are probably about three jobs that I would not trade mine for right now. I'd, I'd trade for you in a heartbeat, Joe, but I wouldn't trade with the mayor. I wouldn't trade with the university president or school superintendent right now because th these are going to be uh, tough times. We're going to manage through them collectively and, and uh, uh, we're going uh, to figure it out. But uh, it's going to be a moving target for sure. And finally, uh, just some general uh, information about uh, symptoms and things of that sort. Seems like we're gathering a lot more information about after effects of this, uh, the heart situation we've heard a lot more about. And we've also heard a lot more about people after they get through this, that something lingers or comes back after a while as far as them dealing with things for the rest of their life, possibly. What have you heard in relation to the after effects and some of the uh, potential health problems that people may have on down the road? It, it continues to evolve in our understanding. Uh, you know, we're gaining information in science every day. Uh, but um, I think that, that really I want to go back to the front side of, of, of this. That underscores why it's important even for our young folks to not become infected with this virus. I, I think maybe we as public health professionals did ourselves uh, no favors when we really focused on elderly and people with comorbidities early on. Uh, we should have talked about the fact that of course, we didn't have the science, but we need to be talking about uh, there's no such thing as a safe age cohort to contract this illness. And uh, let's do what we can to protect ourselves and protect those around us. We have several questions. Some of them were redundant, but I will go through all of them. Um, this is from Katie Cole and Claudette Riley from the newsleader who are um, 
jointly reporting today. With high school football starting in the next few weeks, some teams have already had to cancel practices due to the virus and the players will not be tested. Given that, do you feel comfortable about teams coming from outside Greene County to play here? And a related question, doctors across the country have started to be concerned about the rare heart condition myocarditis and its potential link to young people who test positive for COVID-19. Is that something you all are monitoring here and is there any concern about the long-term effect in kids? So let's start with uh, kids and, and uh, the heart condition. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's it's a real concern, and and uh, you know we're going to continue to collect all the data and all the relevant data that we can uh, related to uh, these uh, health conditions uh, that uh, I addressed with Joe earlier. Um, I don't have good data on that for you today, uh, uh, Claudette and, and Katie, but uh, uh, that's something we can inquire with our health systems and see if they've seen any of those cases. Re regarding team sports. Uh, yeah, it's going to be a challenge, uh, and all you have to do is look at Major League Baseball uh, to see that uh, uh, these are going to create significant challenges for us. Uh, we're going to continue to work with uh, our high school and with our uh, college uh, sports and with the athletic directors and see that, uh, you know, that we mitigate it as best we can. Uh, it, it will be interesting to see what practices bring over the next uh, uh, several uh, weeks. Uh, we know that high school practice starts in earnest, I think, uh, this coming uh, week, uh, you know, starting on Monday. So we're going to continue to learn, uh, and this will, I'm sure, evolve and be, uh, uh, you know, have some, some things that uh, change almost on a daily basis. Okay, from Christine Morton at KY3, um, she asked um, your opinion about the fair, and I believe we've already answered that question. If we haven't, Christine, please text me back, um, and we'll elaborate if necessary. Um, has the health department talked to the many bars downtown where most of the college crowd congregates on weekends? Are the bars preparing for these large groups of people coming to hang out? Will they continue to stay open late, or do you recommend they close early? I also received another question that was somewhat related, but it was a simple question about whether or not police have written any citations so far for the masking ordinance. The answer is no, but the closest we have come is with dealing with local bars. I will add that comment. So to Clay, um, your feelings on local bars. So if we crowd together and we're not masked, that's a perfect recipe for the virus. Remember that there are density restrictions still in place. 50% uh, of, of occupancy uh, is in place. And so we're expecting our establishment managers to abide by that. And we would also hope that our college students would wear masks uh, when they're not uh, uh, eating or drinking. So those are going to be important and fundamental things that we look to. And we are going to be doing enforcement. We're also going to focus on our epidemiology and, and really uh, when we're talking to people, we're going to find out if they've been exposed in that kind of setting. And we're going to let that data drive future pol policy decisions. Uh, there's not anything pending right now, but we're having that conversation. Uh, I know that uh, I, I hope that Matt Morrow won't mind me putting him, uh, you know, kind of on the spot, but he's going to uh, be reaching out to that sector and, and working with them uh, to uh, really drive home uh, the importance of these approaches. Anything you want to add or? Okay. From Bailey Stroll at Color 10, how is the health department doing with hiring more staff and continuing to contract contact, sorry, trace new cases. Are we still behind on tracing? Yes, we're still behind. Uh, I think uh, this last glut of cases uh, put us at a, in a 72 hour window, which is not ideal, but uh, it's better than some of, the, of my Metro counterparts are able to keep. Uh, we were down to 48 hour window. Uh, we've hired a, a whole bunch of people. Uh, that's not a, a a number for you, but uh, I can tell you this, I'm walking around the halls of my health department and don't recognize everybody, so that's a good thing uh, in, in this case. Uh, we're getting them trained up and uh, uh, we hope that next week we'll have some of them uh, trained and ready to call those cases and start to do those investigations. And I'm confident we're going to get to a point where we can get back to that 24-hour window, which is what our preference is. 
From Michelle Skaliski at KSMU Radio. We've answered this in part, but I think she really would like to know your personal opinion, Clay, with college students returning and the largest number of cases being in the 20, 20 to 29 age group, how concerned are you about these cases in that age group continuing to increase in the next few months as colleges open back up? Once again, I'm always concerned about disease transmission, and it, it's not solely focused on college students, uh, but um, it, it's a concern. It's something that the colleges are taking on, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, they're, they're taking it head on, and uh, uh, we're going to have to see what the epidemiology tells us. Uh, we're hopeful that these uh, students are going to be uh, civically minded and they're going to do things to protect themselves. But uh, I believe that all the universities and colleges have robust plans on how to handle people who are sick, how to do quarantine uh, for their exposures. And so uh, we're going to navigate this uh, uh, just as we have every stage of this disease. Uh, we're going to uh, get in there and we're going to take it head on as a community. And we're going to hope that our college students uh, engage in the uh, correct prevention practices. So uh, more to be seen uh, on that front. And the last question I have from Greg Holman at the News Leader, the nationwide count of reported coronavirus deaths likely equaled the population of everyone living in Springfield sometime over last night. Clay, any reflection on that reality and was this avoidable? Well, that's uh, pretty staggering. Um, every one of those individuals was you know, somebody's child or, or uh, somebody's parent, um, somebody's loved one, and um, it, it's heartbreaking. And I think that that maybe makes this a little more real for us. That it, it, we, it, you know, essentially, uh, it's a, it equates to wiping every resident of Springfield out. So it underscores this message that we all know the right things to do to prevent this disease. And so uh, let's employ those tools and uh, let's employ them in a, in a uh, earnest fashion so we can influence the virus. Uh, but uh, that does certainly uh, create a very, very sobering uh, uh, image of the devastation that this disease has wrought on our, on our nation. Clay, you mentioned those preventative steps. Um, I just want to point out that the city and the health department have several videos. All right, that was the last question for health and city officials there. We will continue to keep this live stream going on our Facebook page as well as our website, ozarksfirst.com, for as long as they are there. Just a few things before I let you go. Mayor Ken McClure did issue a renewal for the civil emergency in Springfield, which means it goes on for another 30 days until September 15th, and that means nothing changes the, the way we have had a mask mandate and guidance guidelines for businesses at 50% capacity. We will have all of those details on our website, ozarksfirst.com, and continue to keep this live stream going on that website as well as our Facebook page. We'll take you back now to your regular programming. Thanks for joining us for this special report. This is a